just a quick note about today's episode, just to give you a heads up, as with real life, it does contain some adult language, so sensitive ears may not want to give a listen, or at least just know there are a couple of adult words like you might encounter in real life, because the characters do talk like real people talk. So, heads up, can't get mad at me. Love you guys, enjoy the episode. Hello again, welcome back to the Bookshelf Podcast. Today's excerpt is going to be from a book that I reviewed on Tuesday of this week. Uh, That would be review episode number two, in case you want to go back and take a listen to it. The book is Art of Seduction by, and I'm going to butcher her name again, and I'm so sorry, Monique, Monique Ogeron? I hope I got a little closer that time. Um, This book was awesome. Let me just say that. So, here's what the book is about. This is the description, the blurb for Art of Seduction. Love was never supposed to be part of the end game. Fallon's life has been a road paved in misery and loneliness. Then one day she's propositioned with a way to change it all. Excuse me. From that day forward, she planned on never looking back. That is, until she met her target. The man who could destroy everything. Fallon's a survivor, but can she survive him? Gabriel is independent and brutal. He learned early on about his mother's games. For years, she tried to control every aspect of his life. Born to be her successor, he refused to be her chess piece. But then a mysterious woman shows up. Gabriel's life is turned upside down. Is she his mother's pawn? Soon, both of them will learn the games Gabriel's mother, Catherine Stern, plays are for keeps. Secrets and deception always find a way of being revealed. So, today I'm going to read to you the prologue through chapter two, or was it three? It might be three chapters of uh, Art of Seduction. Give you a nice good start on it so you can run out and buy it and jump right on in. So, let's go ahead and get started with the prologue. Love. What a horrible word. I've learned there are many forms of love. Abandonment was my first love. The love I felt for my mother was ripped away from me as a young child. She dumped me like I was trash, which is why the love I had for her was unrequited. The love you have for a sibling or friend, the love you hold close to your heart, that was my love for Laura. She was my kindest love. Protecting her meant everything to me, and failing her was my biggest shame. I still carry that guilt for the rest of my life. Torture and pain came next. Love from a spouse was the most terrifying, to be tortured by a man who promises you forever nearly led to my destruction. True love was my sorrow. The love that was returned when never meant to be, that was the most hurtful love of all. Unconditional love was my last love. The love one has for their children is so precious and never-ending. From the moment I held them in my arms and looked into their eyes, I knew failing them would never be an option. My life is theirs, and they will never suffer. All my pain and sorrow will disappear, and I will suffer for their survival. It is the sweetest love I know. I vow to always protect and love them for all the rest of my days, no matter what the cost. This is my reprieve, or salvation, if you will. My story is written through the pages of my son's lives. Gabriel, Xander, Liam, and my sweet, tortured boy, Vin. Catherine Stern.
Chapter 1. Fallon. Walking to work this morning, I start to get the strangest feeling someone is watching me. As I look around, I don't see anyone. But then again, I never see anyone. This isn't the first time I've felt this way. Paranoid much? Definitely. But fuck it. I have every right to be. I've been on guard my whole life. My home life wasn't for the faint of heart. My mother drank heavily during my childhood. She was once an enchanting woman, but the years have changed her for the worst. Her beauty is long gone now, and nothing is left except a frail woman who looks far older than her 44 years. Drinking has left her bitter and mean. I imagine it's also left me bitter. Years of taking care of her have been a nightmare. The only time I wasn't taking care of her was when I was drifting between her and foster care. It all started either with my teacher seeing the state of my clothing or a neighbor watching me dig through the trash for food. They would then call in the great state of Louisiana to take me from my mom, and off I would go into the system. Foster care wasn't any better. At least it was a change. My mom would go to court begging for my return, making false promises, saying she changed. She even showed improvements for the courts. But as soon as I got back home, she was back to treating me like dirt, telling me how worthless I was. I do have vague memories of a loving mother, though, one who would kiss my cheek and sing me sweet lullabies. Sometimes I think I, have may, I may have imagined it all because there is no longer anything sweet about my mother. She truly is as nasty as the poison she drinks. Oh shit! My thoughts are broken as I nearly fall because of the crumbling cement that makes up the sidewalk leading to Earl's Diner where I work. This part of New Orleans is a rough area and it feels forgotten from the rest of the city. Everything here is neglected. Between the heat, humidity, and hopelessness in the air, it's all rather depressing. Looking around my surroundings is second nature. This is a necessity in this area. Safety and security are a luxury I've never had. God knows I've never felt safe with my mother. Thinking of her brings back a memory of when I was younger. I had found an envelope filled with photographs of a younger version of my mother. She was so pretty. In one of the pictures, she was leaning against a brick building with another girl and a guy. The guy was in the middle and had his arms around both of them. You could see sadness behind my mother's green eyes, the same eyes I see when I look in the mirror. I spent many hours imagining why, at, the, at that age, she looked so sad. Was her life as shitty as mine? Another picture was of my mother and the same woman from the previous picture. They were both so glamorous. They were dressed up like they were at a party. They looked happy. Well, or at least they were smiling. I don't remember smiling much. As I got older, my body started to receive more attention than I wanted. My mother noticed it too. When I was taking care of her, she was fine. But once she saw the looks I began to get, she would tell me things like, You think you're something special? Well, you're not. As I continued to grow, her hatred and jealousy grew too. But there were rare occasions when in her alcoholic state, she became almost regretful. She would say things I could never make out, things I knew were horrible, things I didn't want to acknowledge or learn more about. Then she would say things about how she loved me and was so sorry she wasn't a better mother. The scariest words to come out of her mouth were about protection and guilt. Just like most of her words, they weren't clear or concise, but I could feel the fear she had. Well, I'm on my own now, and at 18, that's fine with me. She threw me out almost six months ago, telling me never to come back. Being too old for the system anymore left me homeless and scared, but I survived those months and learned I was fine without her. However, I'm not very far from being homeless again. I don't have anyone to count on. No father or extended family, no friends, not even a boyfriend. 
but I guess that's my fault. I would describe myself as plain, but I guess that's my fault too. When I started getting more attention from my mother's boyfriends, I began to cover my body as much as possible. I wanted to be invisible. Maybe if they couldn't see my new curves, they would look at me like they did. I do know I'm pretty, but therein lies the problem. Being pretty in the place I grew up in is dangerous. My face is clear of blemishes and scars. I have deep brown hair, a round face with a button nose, and straight teeth. Many people have told me that my eyes are my best feature. They are the palest of green at a glance. They almost appear to look like glass, like you can see through them. But no matter how plain I made myself, she still allowed her jealousy to turn into rage. I wonder if she even cared that I hated all the looks. Today, my mother doesn't want to acknowledge me anymore, and that's fine by me. I'm too old to go back into foster care, but that's a relief. The last foster care I had been in was a nightmare. They had an older son who would stare at me constantly. I needed to protect myself as much as a kid could. I got my hands on a steak knife because I knew he would eventually come. One night, I heard him enter my room and I readied myself. When he came near, I stabbed him repeatedly in his arm. I watched as he bled, but I wanted more blood. He had no right to touch me. Of course, I was the one blamed and the incident was all covered up. I was satisfied, though, knowing he will never do that shit again. Not to me. No one will. I am, uh, I am alone, but I am tired of being scared, and I won't be a victim anymore. From now on, I will not let anyone affect my life. My mother will not be my problem anymore. Her wants and needs always came before mine. Taking care of her had been my priority, but not anymore. I will live as I want, be my own priority, and even if I fail, it will be on my terms. Chapter 2, Fallon I make it to the diner just in time. It's a poor excuse of an establishment, but in the part of the city I live in, no one is allowed the luxury of being too picky. I start my day with making pots of coffee for the customers while begging Earl to give me more shifts. But he says he can't give me any more hours. There just aren't enough customers to cover the expense. I guess I will have to look for a second job soon. While I'm wiping the counters, a woman walks in. She's older, probably in her mid-forties. She's gorgeous, almost regal. Her hair is blonde and her complexion is polished. I admire how her body has been kept in great shape. She's wearing a camel-colored jacket with a deep brown pencil skirt that accentuates her curves. Her taut legs lead to a pair of expensive-looking heels. She definitely doesn't belong in this diner or even in this part of the city. I've seen her here before. She's been coming into the diner for a couple of weeks. She orders a coffee, sits, and stares at me while I work. She never says anything more than her order for coffee yet she always leaves me a nice tip. So, it's easy to say I look forward to seeing her walk in. However, it's weird how she stares, almost like she's studying me. I want to tell her to knock it off every time, but I need that tip. I'm always nice and polite trying to get her to speak to me, but she never replies. It's downright creepy. I guess it could be worse. If she were a man, I would be scared to death to leave the diner at night. But with her, for some reason, I'm not. The next night, at the end of a long shift, the doors of the diner open. The same woman appears again, but this time there is a very large man with her. The woman goes to sit in her now regular spot while the man walks up to Earl. They start to speak to each other, but I can't hear anything they say. Next thing I know, Earl is walking out the door and the man is locking. I turn to look at what's going on, and the woman starts to speak to me. Fallon, I would like for you to have a seat with me, so we can finally learn about each other. I gasp. How do you know my name? She points to my name tag. Of course. That's how. But then she says, I know a lot about you, Fallon. She has me baffled. 
What do you mean? She tilts her head towards the chair and says, Join me for a conversation, dear, won't you? As I walk up to her, crossing my arms, I say, I don't know. I don't think I like you very much. She laughs and says, Oh, this is where things get interesting. See, I don't care whether you like me or not. I am not looking for a friend. You not liking me is not a problem I have. But for you, that's a problem you don't want to have. See, we don't have to be friends, but we can be allies. She pauses, appraising me some more, then continues. I could teach you so much. I snicker towards her. What do you, could you possibly teach me? Well, for starters, to understand me. I'm like a chameleon. I can be what everyone dreams of me to be. I can also be your worst nightmare. I am a very dangerous woman, when and if I need to be. Then she asks, Tell me, little girl, what is it you want? What are you expecting out of life? She gestures to the diner. Do you want to stay at this dead-end job for the rest of your life? Maybe find love with some piece of shit who will treat you badly. Or do you want more? I shake my head, becoming defensive. I don't know what you want or who you are, but that is none of your business. She smiles. That's where you are wrong. What are your dreams? Do you want to find your place in life? Do you want love or to be rich beyond belief? Perhaps you want power. Desire, my dear, is the answer to all of your problems. When you're desired, it can be extremely powerful, like a drug. To fit in, to be loved, to be rich, you must be desired. Then, and only then, can you become powerful. I have seen so many girls like you, Fallon, come and go, wanting all of it. Stupid girls, not knowing the basic steps to achieve their goals. I thought I saw potential in you at first, but now I am questioning myself. And that is something I rarely do. You see, my dear, I am cunning, patient, and always listening. I am always watching instead of speaking just to be heard. When I want to be heard, trust me, I will be. They will all listen because nothing leaves my mouth without a purpose. Her eyes burn through me as she tells me, sit down, I am losing my patience. Without a second thought, I sit as ordered. She self-righteously continues, you stated you don't like me. That was an attack without knowing what direction this would lead. In poor taste, I might add. You see, your words don't affect me. Because you did it without thinking. You tried to show power without having any. What do you think I was going to do? Cry? She lets out a small laugh and continues. Cords, especially yours, are not sharp enough to do any damage. File your teeth, little girl. I bite, and when I do, I go in for the kill. Scared yet? What do you want with me? Knowledge. What kind of knowledge can you possibly want from somebody like me? You see, you might like me after all, little girl. Tell me, are you a virgin? Shocked, I say. I, I don't see how that's any of your concern. Ah, uh, but it is. I will teach you. However, I never do anything for nothing. I return her stare and ask, again, what do you want from me? Simple. I want a daughter-in-law. With a chuckle, I say, what? You can't be serious. I don't know what kind of game you're playing, but hush, little one. The games I play are to win. You can either stay here or come with me. I can promise you that I can offer so much more than what you already have. Are you interested? I look straight at her. Wanting to see if I, waiting to see if I notice any signs that she's pulling my strings. I keep an eye out for any loose screws she might have, yet I see none. She looks dead serious. Curious, I say, tell me more. Now, I see I have your attention. Answer my question. I'm not in the habit of repeating myself, dear. Are you a virgin? 
I surprised myself by answering. Yes. Wonderful. Let's begin. Chapter 3. Fallon. My eyes flow down to her turning her delicate bracelet around her wrist as she continues. I have three sons who were born to be powerful, but it takes a woman to lead them. I led their father, and you will lead one of them. I am in shock. This can't be real. I don't understand. I am a nobody to people like you. I am sure there is someone more suited for your sons. I don't want a child who was raised to be a trophy wife. I want someone strong. I want someone who knows how to fight and who's not afraid of getting dirty. Trust me, there will come a point when you will need to fight and get dirty doing it. I have one son in particular that I am interested in for you. He is my eldest, my pride and joy. My son will need a strong woman by his side for what I have in store for him. He will be a leader of many and will be powerful beyond measure. So you see, a meek woman simply will not do. What does he think about all this? I mean, does he really need his mother to find him a woman? No, no, he doesn't, and he will never know about this. You mean he has no knowledge of what you're looking to that you are looking to find him a wife? No. My son is a very good looking man, but he is a man and I need to make sure he makes the right decision in picking a bride. Okay, so what if your son doesn't like me? Don't worry. By the time I'm finished with you, he will desire you more than any other woman in the world. I promise. I straighten my stance. Okay, say he does like me and we do marry. Won't I just be his property? How does that get me pow the power I want? Yes, you will belong to him, but he will belong to you too. And that, my dear, is power. How? As you can see, dear, you have a lot to learn. Have you ever heard the phrase, behind every good man there is a great woman? I nod as she continues. Maybe you've heard about how the man is the head of the family? The man may be the head of the family, but the woman is the neck. As his neck, you can turn his head in any direction you want, hence making you very powerful indeed. I question, why would you want to do this to your son? Why do you want to control him? I've had control over all of them their whole lives. I have taught them everything. I was not a woman who handed her children off. I raised my sons. I taught them everything. Made every opportunity for them. I held this family together when their father was not the man they needed him to be. He was weak. But I, I was the strong one. He didn't want this life, so I used him into what, it, what was needed. Why? For my future. For my children's future. And for your future. But now, the time has come where they need a woman, not a mother. I will be behind the scenes. See, they will always have me in their lives, one way or another. You and I will become allies. And in return, we will grow this family, ensuring our descendants will have everyone on their knees, bending to our will not the other way around. She then pauses and looks straight at me. I have done my fair share of bending on my knees, and in one way, I am sure you have too, haven't you? With a smile, she continues. We know what it's like to be poor, to struggle. A long time ago, I decided to change my life for no one else but me. I didn't think about having children. In some ways, Having a child made me soft, not in the conventional way, but it did make me more vulnerable, easier to hurt. So I had to think of a way to harden myself again. I had to make them strong like me. In a way, if I would have had daughters, it would have been easier. Girls can be smarter, more cunning than a lot of men. 
I would have made them the right connections and with the right men. Instead, I have sons, and I need to find the right women for all of them. Some debutante girl who has never had a struggle in her life will not do. My boys need fierce women. Are you ready to be a fierce woman? I think before I respond, almost as if she has already taught me to think before speaking. I feel like being under this woman's thumb, she means to break me. I can see it in her eyes, but I can also see she plans on building me back up. How is she even going to, even so sure this will work? Am I enough for what she has planned? Could he really fall in love with me? What's love anyway? I've never seen it or experienced it, and frankly, I don't want to. I can handle whatever comes my way as long as my heart never gets involved. Can I really do this? Do I have any other choice? I'm not in the best place to be picky, but I am free. It could po be possible for me to have a better life, but at what cost? I answer simply with a whisper, yes, but what about love? I don't care about love, child. This is about something greater. After thinking it over again, I look back at her and tell her my answer. I'll go with you. The woman is unmoving, reflecting on my answer. Then she smiles and says, good. I can't believe I am going to do this. I realize I don't even know who she is or her family. What's her name? She looks shocked as if I, she can't believe I don't know who she is. She answers, Catherine, Catherine Stern. I start to freak out. The Stern family is feared. They are known for being from old money and for having different connections in politics. Everyone in the city knows who they are, more like a mafia family. Did you say Stern, as in the Stern family? She stands and starts to walk away. Is there any other Stern family? She speaks with a louder voice. Now, let's go. You won't be back if you're smart. Your new life begins tonight. And that's all we have for our excerpt from Art of Seduction. Again, this is an excellent book, and I'm really looking forward to reading the entire series. I finished this one. You can go back and listen to my review of it from Tuesday this week. Monique has blown me away with this book, and I'm sure she'll continue to blow me away with the rest of the series. Uh, you can find this one and some of the others on Amazon Kindle Unlimited. So if you're a un Kindle Unlimited member, go snatch these up while they're free to read on Kindle Unlimited. Otherwise, visit our Facebook page so that you can pick up the links on where to find Monique and her books. Uh, the Facebook page is facebook.com slash the book shelf pod, T-H-E-B-O-O-K-S-H-E-L-F-P-O-D. Um, that's it for this week. Have a fantastic weekend. Keep reading, and I'll see you next week, bookworms. Just a quick note about today's episode, just to give you a heads up, as with real life, it does contain some adult language, so sensitive ears may not want to give a listen, or at least just know there are a couple of adult words.